Welcome to Understanding Islam, the third series, Building a Just Society. This is week nine, and we're going to be looking at the Sharia. Now, Sharia is a term which receives a bad press because people fail to understand really what it's about. So let's go back to the beginning and work out the basis of the meaning of the word. A Sharia is a path or a way. And if you think about the well from which a village draws its water, the people of that village will go backwards and forwards to that well many times each day, and they will create a path. That path will be as straight and as direct as possible, and it will be very clearly marked out. Now that path would be called a Sharia. So that's the meaning of the word a way through life which has been established and laid out to lead people to a definite end. And that definite end in this case is to paradise, to closeness to God. Now throughout human history, God has been sending prophets to the earth with a new revelation. A whole number of revelations have been sent to the earth, the last of which is the Quran sent to Prophet Muhammad. Now, each of these prophets with a new revelation had the duty of setting out a sharia, or an established way, upon the earth. Now, the core principle of sharia, of living a Muslim life, is that the whole of life has to be brought under God's guidance. So personal life, family life, community, social life, business life, inheritance, everything to do with human life and society comes under God's guidance. So the Sharia is a very wide, all-embracing term. The principal ethic of the Sharia is justice. We are told you are to do justice upon the earth. Indeed, there's one verse in the Quran that tells us, do justice even if it goes against yourself. It's more important that you should do justice. Indeed, justice is something that is open to human reason, it is open to investigation, to be logically proved, and therefore we can say that there is no such thing as Muslim justice or any other kind of justice. There is just justice, and that is what must be done. Now the principal source for this justice, the Sharia upon the earth, is the Quran. And so we might think, well, it would be easy then just to go to the Quran, find a verse that applies to the point in question, and then implement it. This leads us into all sorts of problems. First of all, the Quran hardly ever says everything about a question in just one place. Often, it reveals guidance gradually in different places. So we need to take all the verses from the Quran and see the sequence of their revelation. Next, we have to remember that the Quran is revealed into 7th century Arabia. Therefore, it comes into a context. So we need to know what was going on in the society at that time. What was the question that society was asking to which these verses of the Quran are the answer? We need to ask, how did the Prophet understand it when it was revealed? How did he implement it? How did the early community put it into practice? This requires a great deal of hard work. So it's not just an easy matter, like a cookery book, of going to find the right solution. Over the centuries, the business of tafsir, of commentary upon the Quran, has been something that has engaged scholars 
all the way down through the centuries. So we have huge volumes of commentary. We have also lots of books written about the times of the prophet, the time of the early community, the prophet's own biography, the early histories. We have also his sayings which have been handed down. Now from these various sources we're able to work out what are called the occasions of revelation. What was going on into which this verse spoke? And then we can begin to understand how it is to be interpreted. Of course, within the Shia tradition, we have 300 years of the line of infallible imams after the time of the Prophet, and they were able to give infallible guidance as to how the Quran should be interpreted, how it should be implemented, and they were the guardians, the custodians of the implementation of the Sharia. The second source for Sharia is the lived example of the Prophet, the Sunnah. And this is contained in many traditions of the Prophet what he said, what he did, the things that he approved of, his teaching. Now you can imagine that these sayings were passed around in the early Muslim community and they got passed on from one to another. Somebody would come back from a visit into Medina and they would say, did you hear any new teaching from the Prophet? Oh yes, I was there and I heard him say. So we get a chain of narrators in this way. This is called an isnad. By the time that we get to the 9th century, we then had the availability of mass-produced quantities of paper. And this brought about a significant change because now people were able to compile large systematic collections of the hadith and they put them into chapters under headings. And at this stage, there was a huge sifting that went on so that people classified hadith into different classifications. The highest classification, the sahi, were those that were perfect in every way. You had a clear chain of transmitters that went back to the prophet and they were checked out. Did they exist? Were they reliable? Could you make sure that they were actually in the same place at the same time and so on? This was the way that a hadith came to be regarded as sahi. Then there were further classifications. Hassan, for example, something that was good and reliable but not quite as clearly authenticated as something that was sahi. And then you came further on down until you came to the weak hadith or the daif. And these were to be used in terms of personal piety, but they couldn't be used in terms of creating and establishing law. Now the two principal Sunni collections of these hadith are the collections from the 9th century of Bukhari and Muslim. In the Shia tradition, the Shia regard those immediate early decades in the century or two after the time of the Prophet as being a time of confusion, a, a time when things are not so reliable as they ought to be. And so therefore, in the Shia tradition, Hadith are authenticated by passing through a chain of transmitters that includes one of the infallible Imams. Because they were infallible and sinless, they are able to authenticate a hadith with an authority that cannot exist merely through a human chain of transmitters. Human beings are to do the hard intellectual work based on the Quran and the Sunnah. They are to struggle to find an answer which is in keeping with the earlier teaching of Quran and Sunnah. And this struggling is called ijtihad. Now the methodology then for this personal struggling. In the Sunni schools, the methodology is analogical reasoning, kias. 
finding something that's already been determined which is similar to the question that we are discussing today. Let's take the example of alcohol. You see, we often say, well, alcohol is forbidden according to the Quran. But what the Quran actually talks about is grape wine. Now, the Arabs also made wine from dates. And so the first question for Kias was, is date wine also forbidden? And the scholars then said, well, what effect does grape wine have? It causes people to lose self-control, to demean themselves, to degrade themselves. But date wine has a similar effect. Therefore, the date wine is also forbidden. And then by extension, by analogy, all alcohol is forbidden because it has a similar effect. And then again, by analogy and extension, all what we would call drugs are forbidden because they have the same effect. Now, after some time of working on these questions, the scholars, the ulama, come to a, a single mind. They come to a consensus, an ijma on the question. And this then becomes a solid statement of what the scholars believe to be the Islamic teaching on this question. And then we move from the ijmar of the scholars to the ijmar of the whole community itself. And then we have a solid piece which is agreed by the whole of the Muslim community. And in the Sunni tradition, this is based on a hadith of the Prophet that says, my community will never agree upon an error. Now, in the Shia tradition, this device of kiyas, of analogical reasoning, is not liked. Instead, they prefer to go through a much more precise tool, that of deductive logic. So you create general principles. There is a general principle that all animals that eat other dead animals are forbidden. There's your general principle. Now the question is, what about a hyena? Can we eat that? Hyenas eat dead animals. Therefore, we can say, hyenas are forbidden. You may not eat them. Now you can see that deductive logic maintains its weight of argument in a timeless way down through the centuries. And therefore, the rulings established by deductive logic in the Shia tradition are held to be timeless and ongoing. Whereas the consensus of the people, the ijma, in the Sunni schools is seen to be only transitory because things change. And therefore, in each generation, you have to work out again on the basis of deductive logic, the best guidance that can be applied today. The Sharia classifies human acts into five groups. At one extreme, there are those acts which are obligatory, which must be performed. Some of them are obligatory for every Muslim, like prayer and fasting. Some of them are obligatory on the whole Muslim community but as long as a group of Muslims do them, then they discharge the duty for the whole community, like burying the dead, attending the funeral prayers. At the other end of the spectrum, you have those acts which are forbidden. Drinking alcohol is a good example there. And then you have two classifications that are, that are not forbidden and not obligatory, but they are praiseworthy, they are commendable, recommended. Things like visiting the sick, being the first to greet other people when you meet them. These are recommended acts. There is a blessing for you if you do them, but they're not obligatory. And at this end, you have acts which are not forbidden, but they are disliked, detested. 
They are to be avoided if at all possible. Smoking would be an example here. But then you've got quite a large middle ground. By far the most acts that human beings do are actually classified as neutral, mobile. What colour clothes do you wear? What style of dress do you follow? What sort of diet? What type of food do you like? Do you prefer margarine or butter? These are neutral acts in which the individual makes their own choice and makes their own way. In the early centuries of Islam, you got different ways of following the Muslim way of life that emerged in different parts of the Muslim community. So you got many different schools of Sharia, as we would say then what happens is that over a period of time these group together into five major schools that are in the Muslim world today. Four of these belong to the Sunni community and one to the Twelver Shia community. And so the vast majority of Muslims alive today will follow one of these five schools of law. And this gives you a body of guidance built up over centuries to help you to live a Muslim life. So if you are a member of the Twelver Shia community, then you follow that school of law that was laid down and codified by the sixth Imam, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq. So it's called the Jafari school. If you are a Sunni, there are four different Sunni schools named after some of the early principal scholars of those schools. The, the Maliki, the Hanafi, the Shafi'i, the Hanbali. Now, these four schools exist within the Sunni community and which one you belong to depends very largely on where you were born. So if a Muslim happens to be born in North or West Africa, then the high probability is that she will be Maliki because that's the dominant school in that place. But of course, in our own times, with the mixing of people from one part of the world to another, we get much more of a mixture between these schools. And it is permissible for a Sunni Muslim to change from one school to the other if necessary. And it's also possible to change for a short period of time if one goes and settles and lives in another part of the world where another school is dominant, then it's possible to take some of their rulings. So we can see diversity, mutual respect, is the principle then in following the Sharia. It is not a hard set down set of rules that are unbending, but rather these are principles that have a variety of outworkings amongst the different schools. Now let's face the question, what about today? Because in our own times in society, there are many new questions that come up and people ask, what would be the correct Islamic approach to this question? Well, the obvious thing to do is to go to a Muslim scholar, an alim, and ask, please, can you give me guidance on this question? And if it's something that's already been addressed by the scholars and a clear mind has been taken by the scholars, then it is, as it were, easy to answer off the shelf. But if it's a question that needs original research and working out, and it needs a highly trained and experienced scholar to give a personal judgment on the question, this must then be sent higher to a legal scholar of the highest order called a mufti. And a mufti is somebody who has specialized in the principles of Islamic law. A mufti is someone who is able to give personal judgment. Now, mufti is the Sunni terminology here. The Shia terminology would be an ayatollah who specializes in questions of fiqh or of jurisprudence. 
When one goes to one's mufti or one's specialist ayatollah for a learned opinion, this is a fatwa. Now, a fatwa, learned opinion, it is not the judgment of a court. That's something quite different. This is what you would get if you went to a specialist barrister in the British situation. You would say, on the basis of your accumulated knowledge and wisdom, what do you think is the correct answer to this question? Now, by its nature, then, a fatwa is not the last word. There could be different fatwa on the same question, or different scholars could underwrite the same fatwa and thus strengthen its position. And so we can see here a system in which the, the guidance is emerging. It's being worked on. It's a working process under the guidance of these different muftis. Now, in earlier times, all this would have to be done on a one-to-one -one personal basis. Then it went on to uh, a helpline, a book-based basis. Today, it would be done very often over the Internet. Let's take two case examples from Sharia. An everyday example. What kind of food is permissible for a Muslim to eat? Well, if we look at the teaching of the Quran, we find there three types of food that are forbidden. These are carrion. This means animals that eat other animals or that have died naturally or been killed in an accident or by disease. Blood, whether it be liquid blood or food made from blood. And pork, meaning any kind of food made from the pig. These three forms of meat are forbidden. Now, if it's an animal that is not forbidden, it must be slaughtered according to the rules of Islam. And we often hear the word halal being used here. Halal slaughter, for example. Halal means something is permitted. It's done in the right way. And halal slaughter is important because the animal must be looked after properly during its lifetime. It must be fed and watered before being brought to the slaughterhouse. No animal is allowed to see the suffering of another animal. Before an animal is killed, thanks must be given to God because it's God's life and not yours. And then when you do kill the animal, you must kill it as quickly and as painlessly as possible by cutting its throat, shedding its blood. This is to be done by a skilled slaughterman, and you sever the blood supply to the brain as well as the windpipe so that the blood is deprived of oxygen, and this then renders the animal insensate. It's dead but it still leaves the potential for there to be muscle activity which pushes the blood out of the animal's body because the blood contains the impurities. So you want to get as much of that out as possible. When it comes to the products of the sea, fish and so on, then some schools of Islam will say that anything that comes out of the sea alive is halal, it's fit to be eaten. Others will say only those fish that have fins and scales are fit to be eaten. So they will not accept shellfish, for example. When it comes to vegetables, all vegetables are acceptable for Muslims to eat, except obviously those things that today we would call drugs. And there are no particular rules about how they should be prepared. It's permissible for a Muslim to be a vegetarian, provided that you don't say eating meat is wrong, because God has made meat eating permissible according to the verses of the Quran. And then finally, alcohol is forbidden, it is haram in all forms, whether liquid or in food. And some Muslims will even be very sensitive about the possibility 
of alcohol being used as a base for medicine. If it's at all possible, can we have a medicine that doesn't use alcohol at all? Let's take then one last case study, and this is the case of criminal law. Now, there are 6,235 verses in the Quran, and 350 of these verses are what we would call legal verses. And of those 350, only 30 verses are about criminal law. And so it is a small part of the teaching of the Quran and indeed a small part of the whole legal guidance of the Quran. In a very few cases, the Quran lays down certain punishments attached to certain crimes. These are crimes that affect the stability of the whole Muslim community. Things like theft and adultery, for example, murder. And so these have particular penalties attached to them, and the term had, meaning limit, or hadud, the plural, is attached to these penalties. Now, these are the most severe punishments that are recorded within the Sharia. Remember that we're talking about the 7th century, and in the 7th century, punishments were either corporal, normally a beating, or perhaps in the most severe cases of theft, it could be amputation, or else they are financial. One must make financial restitution to the people who have been affected by the crime. Now, these had then, the Prophet on one occasion says, go to every length to find a ground to keep away from the Khadud. So, look and see if there are any extenuating circumstances that could mean that the Khadud is not appropriate for this particular case. This is then to be worked out in the court by the judge, and indeed some Muslim scholars will say that Khadud is actually what we would today call the highest tariff. That is, if the judge, in his judgment, her judgment, thinks that that is the appropriate punishment, that's as high as they can go. But it's also possible that there are extenuating circumstances that mean that a lower punishment is more appropriate. If we just take one example, the example of adultery, we can see then the extremely high degree of evidence that would be needed to convict somebody under this rule of HUD. You need to have four adult eyewitnesses who were present to witness in minute detail the act itself. They must agree in every respect and they must persevere in their testimony right up to the point of witnessing the execution. Now, if you only bring three witnesses instead of four, the case is dismissed and those three witnesses are to be beaten in public because they have brought that person's good name into disrepute. If you bring forward witnesses who change their story under cross-examination so that you don't have your body of witnesses to convict, the case is dismissed, the witnesses are all beaten, and those who change their story are never to be accepted as witnesses again. So we can see an extremely high level of evidence is necessary, or the persistent repeated confession of the individual. And in such a case, of course, the judge would want to know, is this person sane? Are they fit to testify in this way? Are they under any duress or pressure? And then just a final point about witnesses. One would have to ask, what kind of witnesses actually stood by and watched this happening? 
without doing anything to stop it. And so to bring in a case to the highest level of the hard punishment would be extremely difficult to bring forward the evidence to convict. And yet the point is there, the point is taken. Adultery is a major offence that destabilizes the whole of society because it underpins the fundamental building block of marriage. Therefore, keep away from it. Join me next week when we're going to be looking at the themes of peace, jihad and war. I look forward to seeing you then.